following is proudly presented by Affleck. Live from University Hall on the campus of Columbus State University, WRBL News 3, PMB Broadcasting, the Ledger Inquirer, and the Greater Columbus Chamber of Commerce present the 2014 Columbus Mayoral Debate. Good evening from Columbus State University. I'm Phil Scoggins, your moderator for tonight's debate. We welcome all of you who are watching both on WRBL and online, as well as those of you who are listening on Boomer 95.3. Tonight's technical production is a joint venture between WRBL and CSU Television. Tonight's debate features the Columbus mayoral candidates. They are incumbent Teresa Tomlinson, and challenger Colin Martin. Please join me in welcoming the candidates tonight. Tonight's debate has three parts. Part one features a series of questions from our media panel tonight. When it is their turn to go first, each candidate will get one minute and 30 seconds to answer their question. The other candidate will then have one minute for rebuttal. My colleague, Teresa Whitaker, will join me for part two of our debate tonight. We will ask the candidates questions submitted by News 3 viewers, as well as Ledger Inquirer readers and CSU political science students. Teresa will then pose two questions submitted by members of you, our audience, here at University Hall. In that particular round, each candidate will get one minute to answer, followed by one minute for rebuttal. We will end tonight's debate with closing statements from each candidate. We also want to invite you at home to take part in this debate. Along with our partners at the Ledger Inquirer, we'll share some of your Twitter comments at the bottom of our screen over the course of the next hour. Simply add the hashtag ColumbusDebate to your tweets and join in on the conversation. As I mentioned earlier, we are joined by three media panelists, and it's time to meet them now. They are Dusty Nix, the editorial page editor with the Ledger Inquirer. David Hurst, digital journalist from WRBL News 3. And Brandon Short, editor of the Sabre, the student newspaper here at Columbus State University. Thank you all for being our media panelists tonight. A coin toss determined the order of tonight's questioning. The first question from Dusty Nix is for Colin Martin. Dusty? Thank you. Mr. Martin. Good evening. Good evening. Your website says, and I quote, homeowners deserve property tax relief now. The city, meanwhile, is short on revenue and running annual deficits in the sheriff's office. First of all, what is your plan for property tax relief and for balancing that with adequate funding for city operations? Well, Dusty, thanks for the question. And, and the first thing is, is I want folks to know I support the freeze and keeping it in place and no upward pressure on your property taxes. Uh, we need to grow our economy, and you asked what the plan is uh, to, uh, to bring in more tax revenue. Grow our economy, bring in more businesses, because businesses will pay more in, in taxes, both property taxes, occupational taxes, and sometimes generate sales taxes that takes that pressure off of homeowners to always bear that burden. We need to, we need to do something called priority budgeting. Under the current administration, it's been a 1.5 across the board cut, which is not a responsible way to cut. We need to do priority budgeting and have a collaborative effort between department heads and the, and the mayor's office to determine what is the best things to cut and right size our government. Um, the other thing is there are certain city services that can be privatized. Some of them are already operating autonomously anyway. So when we can put those city services under private uh, hands, those legacy costs go away. And then finally, in the previous election, the mayor promised efficiency audits. So far, only two departments have been audited in four years. When I become mayor, we'll have the audit the entire government and find the savings, talk to the folks who actually do the work in the city government. They have the best suggestions for moving the city forward and cutting the budget without um, cutting uh, city services and cutting personnel. Mayor Tomlinson, you have one minute. Certainly. Well, first of all, I want to 
thank you all for having this impressive debate. Thank CSU for hosting it. But to get down to it, um, a couple of things. I think some of uh, what Mr. Martin said is, is based on a bit of misinformation. We audit our departments all the time. Efficiency audits are something completely different. We have done two, and they've been very helpful. They've shown that there's millions of dollars of efficiencies to be uh, reaped in our tax assessor's office, and we're actually moving forward to reform that. And also, we've been able to look at the police department and have some very significant adjustments that we believe will bring a more efficient service to the citizens. But to get to the budget, we've reformed uh, uh, basic systemic deficits we've had created a firmer foundation and as it relates to the property tax burden the last uh, you know my suggestion is actually if you have the property tax freeze you keep it and uh, we create a new system in which future transfers vest with a 10 percent property tax decrease that shows you how our current system is so inefficient we actually end up taxing people on value they do not own and we can't do that any longer Thank you, Mayor. Our next question comes from David Hurst. David, you'll be directing it to Mayor Tomlinson. Mayor Tomlinson, in spite of the money raised for police officers since the 2008 loss vote, Columbus is still dealing with the issue of retention, specifically salary compression. How serious is this problem and what is your administration doing to address it? Sure. I think the most important thing to realize is that we have 70 more officers on the street than we did in 2008 when we passed the other lost. And that's a direct result of the other lost. So there's 70 more officers on the street today because of that tax. The other thing is we're actually losing most of our officers in the first two years. I think that uh, looking at how we can address this most effectively is to decide if we're getting the right applicants in. I think we can improve our application process significantly because each one of those trainees cost us $50,000. If we can save that money, which is quite significant by getting a better applications process, then of course we have uh, plenty of resources to do things such as longevity bonuses, which I'm very much in support of. Uh, and so I think we need to reduce the number of officers we lose in the first two years by getting the right applicants. And then I think we need to um, uh, assist those individuals that stay with us for five and seven years by giving them uh, longevity bonuses. But I will say we are getting return on our investment. Crime has been down. Uh, since the 2008 investment, it's been down uh, 15 to 23 percent every year I've been in office, and that is indeed a return on investment. Mr. Martin. In 2010, candidate Tomlinson said not only did we need 200, the 488 officers in the lost, she said we needed 80 more than that to reach a ratio of 2.5 uh, officers per thousand. Uh, now we're 100 below what the level she called for in 2010, and we have 24 less than 2010. Look, pay is an issue. Uh, they're, they're not making, I have officers tell me all the time they're making less now take home pay than they did at any time go past because of changes in insurance and tax law and other things. We've got to address that. We've got to address retirement pay. And then finally, we've got to address um, uh, respect for the officer and treating them with dignity, which I am committed to doing. Uh, and tonight, I'm just committing to those officers. You will never have to worry if I speak to you in public. You'll never have to worry if I don't listen to your ideas. I will be a public safety uh, advocate. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from Brandon Short with a saber. Brandon, your question for Mr. Martin. Thank you, Phil. Um, since we're here at CSU, I think it's fitting to ask, over the next four years, uh, what will you do to strengthen the relationship between the city of Columbus and Columbus State University? Well, thank you, Brandon. It's great to see you. Um, one of the most important things we can do is I, I keep talking about economic development. I got to spend a few minutes last week with uh, Governor Deal and I learned something important that has a direct impact on CSU. And that is, is that the city of the state of Georgia is getting now $3.3 billion economic impact from uh, the film and television industry. Very little of that is here. Uh, and yet we have downtown arts and entertainment school, the school of uh, performing arts and other things. We need to bring some of those jobs here so those folks who are learning those uh, skills in downtown Colum in uptown Columbus can get jobs and stay here and grow our economy. The creative industry is where it's at. Two counties away in Coweta County, we have one of the most popular television shows in the world, The Walking Dead, being produced. In Fayette County, a uh, studio out of London, England built the largest sound stage uh, in the United States in Fayette County. We need to get more of that. Now there's been a commission that's met so far, there's not been a lot of urgency about getting some things done from that. 
we need to move that forward because if we want to keep the young people who are living downtown now, who are going to class downtown now, to stay in our area, we need to provide them jobs. And the way to do that is with economic development, and the way to do that is to target this $3.3 billion industry that is a big success in Georgia. Well, I know we're in the political season, but at some point facts do matter, and there is a movie commission that is meeting, and it is meeting uh, regularly. In fact, as you know, we did have a, a major film here just last summer, um, and so we're looking actually at the creative industry. I'm glad that was brought up. A uh, proposal that I have on the table in a commission that's meeting right now is to create a creative village uh, just north of Total Systems and south of Bibb City. Uh, that would be an enhancement to the CSU growth that we already have downtown and it would be created for young people, students, mixed income uh, community um, for those creative industries which are everything from software design uh, to the arts but basically it's young people who corporations need very much to see the world in a new way and if we have that in Columbus, Georgia uh, we will be well set uh, to create uh, to br bring creative industries high paying jobs to our community. Community. Thank you, Mayor. Next question comes from Dusty Nix. Dusty, this will be addressed to Mayor Tomlinson. Yes. <clears throat> Mayor Tomlinson, uh, you mentioned crime statistics a while yes. ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a major point of debate between you and Mr. Martin uh, is crime. Mm -hmm. um, so how extensive is or is not the crime problem in Columbus relative to comparable cities? And what should the mayor, as head of public safety, do to address that? Yeah. Well, a couple things. If there's one crime, Dusty, there's a problem, in my opinion. I have zero tolerance for crime, and so I'm not going to rest until crime is zero. Uh, but you're right, it has been an unnecessary point of debate. I think what we need to remember, and I actually brought a demonstrative exhibit, is that crime is down. Uh, you, you just can't hide from this fact. Crime is indeed down and we just released the first quarter statistics which confirm that our crime is still trending down. So we have reached a new plane, it's not low enough and that's why we have to do things like intelligence led policing uh, which we're working on and have been investing in um, and also we're going to be restructuring our patrol division for more intensive uh, patrolling. Uh, but again, um, no crime is to be tolerated, but at the same time our hardworking law enforcement officers, uh, which I do work with regularly as public safety director, um, have been doing a great job at solving the crimes that we do have, locking up the people to get them off the street, and making Columbus a safer city, and I'm very proud of that record. Mr. Martin. On a cold Sunday morning, Marilyn Bailey was gunned down in a drive-by shooting. The following Saturday night, her family had a candlelight vigil that my wife and I attended. Tell those folks crime's down. Tell the folks in Midtown who have hear gunshots in the distance that crime is down. The crime statistics we hear about don't include things like drug uh, arrests. They don't include misdemeanors. Those are all crimes and affecting. We saw the result of the Gallup poll. 49% are afraid to walk alone in our streets. That's a problem. And that's on top of after our city budget we put hundred and two million dollars into uh, public safety because of the second permanent sales tax. We deserve better, and I'll get this there. Thank you, sir. David Hurst has the next question for Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin, the need for developing and improving the south side of Columbus seems to have become a constant challenge for Columbus leadership. What needs to be done to make this area of the city prosper? Well, that's a great question. You know, I learned uh, in, during this campaign that the unemployment rate in the 31903 zip code is over 11 percent. That's a lot of South Columbus. Uh, we've got to bring jobs there that the folks there can have. And you know, the great thing is, is there's infrastructure already there. The heart of our tourism district is, is South Columbus. It starts, you, you know, if you stretch it a little bit, it starts in uptown, but it definitely starts at the Civic Center to uh, A.J. McClung Memorial Stadium, uh, to the South Commons Civil War Naval Museum, and then ends at the biggest tourist attraction of all, which is Fort Benning, Georgia. I propose that we create opportunity zones, something we've not done. A commission's recommended, but again, a commission can recommend all, all day long. Until you get six votes from council, it doesn't matter. We need to adopt opportunity zones, focus on tourism, build the infrastructure. When I served on the South Columbus Revitaliz Revitalization Task Force, one of the issues residents in that area said is they wanted better retail and more restaurants, upscale restaurants. Tourism can help us bring those restaurants and retail there. It's a great area. I'm from there. I grew up there. My mother lived there until the day she died in 2005. I'm committed to growing South Columbus. Mayor Thomas. 
a couple of things. We've actually been doing some innovative outside the box thinking to bring growth uh, to South Columbus and we've invested over $300 million in the last few years in South Columbus with the Fort Benning gateways. We'll soon be cutting uh, our breaking ground on the South Columbus um, streetscape, South Lumpkin Road streetscape, uh, as well as rails to trails in that area, Westville Living Museum, of course our, our um, uh, infantry museum and other investments that are paying off big. But we all, we have already applied for opportunity zones with the state, which we have to do for approval, and that was a result of uh, the Mayor's Commission on uh, tax review. Uh, and we already have military zones, and we are pursuing um, some very promising economic development activity. Uh, but let me just say, uh, related to uh, memorials for uh, victims, I've been to plenty of memorials for victims, including C.J. Foster, many others. Now, Mr. Martin wasn't there, but I would never suggest it's not because he cares. He's just new to the civic realm, which I've been involved now with for many years, many years, and we all care <laughs> about victims in this community, and I think that's our Thank you, Brandon Short, we have our next question. This one goes to Mayor Tomlinson. Brandon. All right. Um, what is your plan for growing the Columbus economy uh, for the benefit of all its of the citizens, all of its citizens? I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? To, to grow the Columbus community for what was it? Grow the Columbus economy for the benefit of all of its citizens. Ah, so very important. One of the biggest drags on our economy right now is our poverty rate. Uh, the Columbus poverty rate is above the national and state average and it has to do with the fact that we've grown over uh, many decades in a way that allowed for disinvestment in large parts of our community and so we have to come back with like that 300 million dollars I was talking about investment in South Columbus uh, we will soon be of course um, breaking ground on the Buena Vista spider web to bring the street underneath the um, the train tracks, infrastructure issues like that which make it right for private investment. And so uh, we have to begin turning public and private investment uh, with the opportunity zones which we've already applied for, the military zones uh, and other um, innovative things. I'll say we actually uh, passed unanimously on council, 10 votes uh, passed our proposal to have urban service district tax abatements um, for investment in blighted areas. Uh, we'll have on the ballot in this November. Council uh, unanimously supported a proposal I put forward to put forth redevelopment districts back on the ballot in November. Those are things that go direct to creating jobs and having growth in our blighted areas and that brings actually and benefits every single citizen in Columbus because it's our blighted and struggling areas that puts a drag on the growth of our community. Mr. Martin. You know, I'm glad the mayor brought up about uh, the uh, spider web because that came about because of the T-SPLOS. I guess I'm so new to civic engagement that I wasn't involved in that. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I led the T-SPLOS mayor and a month ago you stood in a meeting and said you were against it and that I was wrong to be for it. And so let's... I let's, never said that. But yes, go ahead. yes, you did. No, and, I didn't. and there's folks here who were there at the meeting be happy to correct it. But the T-SPLOS passed because uh, of, we talked about those very issues. Another great issue we have is we're going to put an uh, exit ramp off of Interstate 185 to Casita Road uh, to open up a, a park there that will bring jobs. And, uh, you know, I have been doing politics in this town for 20 years. I've been involved in all kinds of campaigns. And uh, I am not new to this, but I was proud of what we did with the T-SPLOST. And when that Civic Center, when that, um, when that uh, train no longer stops people, I'll be proud to see that happen. The next round of questions begins with Dusty Nix and for Mr. Martin. Dusty? Well, Mr. Martin, you just mentioned trains. <laughs> um, so, um, what is your view on the importance or otherwise of passenger rail service connecting Columbus and Atlanta? Thanks for the question, Dusty. It's an interesting idea. Uh, I was uh, a part of the Passenger Rail Commission. I'd like to see us focus on some more immediate needs first. Uh, Fort Benning is an important issue. Right now we are behind other defense communities in preparing. We need to do a uh, SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to figure out what we need to do as a region to be ready for the next round of BRAC. We need to know what Fort Benning can handle because if, if Fort Benning is the very foundation of our economy, if it continues to shrink it way it has been, in fact, over 6,000 jobs are gone from out there because of budget cuts, we won't have enough people to ride the train, the plane, whatever, we've got to protect that asset. There's not a job in Columbus that is not directly or indirectly 
uh, impacted by Fort Benning. So if we're going to make a priority list, uh, I think the Fort Benning uh, piece needs to be at the top. And then secondly, we need to continue to grow jobs for all of our citizens. And uh, I'm a firm believer in economic development. I got a small taste of it when I worked in the Chamber of Commerce, but I worked more on the governmental affairs side in making sure the laws were right for economic development, and I enjoyed that an awful lot. I want to see us grow, and that to me is more important. Not that train's a bad idea, it's 20 years from now, but I think we need a lot more study, but focus our efforts on, on growing our economy right now. Yeah. Uh, well, Dusty, it's a very exciting opportunity. I will say one of the number, the number one proponent for it is actually Fort Benning. The garrison commander has attended almost every single one of our meetings, and when he was not there, the deputy garrison commander was there uh, because it is that important to uh, Fort Benning's um, mission, and also it helps um, put us in good stead for a second round of BRAC that we have that type of resource. So the exciting thing about uh, the rail to Atlanta, high-speed rail to Atlanta, is that it looks from the feasibility study that would be profitable it also looks that it will create a minimum of 11,000 uh, 11, jobs, uh, which basically is the equivalent of four Kia plants. Uh, that's quite significant. We can't ignore it or put it on the back burner. Uh, moving today at the rate we are would be built in 16 years, which is pretty phenomenal, but it would be a game changer for Columbus and it would bring millions of dollars in growth and expansion into this community. Thank you, Mayor. David Hurst, you have the next question for Mayor Tomlinson. Mayor Tomlinson, uh, Mr. Martin's website raises the issue of transparency in city government. Mm -hmm. Is this a problem in Columbus? And if so, what should change? Well, I'd say one of the things actually I'm proudest of uh, is uh, transparency. We've been bringing government to people through the Let's Talk with the Mayor forums, which are a phenomenal forum that allows people to ask any questions for an hour and a half. And, uh, and then we also, of course, have opened up on Facebook. I get text messages and 200 emails a day from citizens. Um, I told them when I ran that I would bring the government to them, and that's exactly what we've done. Uh, of course, we've made ourselves even more available to the members of the media, as you know. Uh, even if it's an unfortunate situation, we tee it up and we discuss it and give you all the information you need so we can inform our citizens. And we've also expanded um, the use of our CCG TV to add to that and transparency as well. I will say that Mr. Martin spent a lot of time talking about taking us back to the days of backroom deals and backroom discussions, which is also in his materials. And I think those days were done. That was the 1950s. Uh, we're in a whole new era now. We are in an era of transparency. Our citizens demanded of us, and that's exactly what they've received from this administration. Mr. Martin. You know, it's interesting, she talks about transparency. She had her hand out, I have mine. This is an email that Mayor Thompson sent to all the city councilors wanting small group meetings to talk about the reserve. Now, the only reason you have small group meetings of less than six is so you don't have to notify the media and you don't have to have public scrutiny when talking about public money. So, you know, when you talk about transparency of government, this will not happen when I am mayor. We will have all of our discussions in the public. Now, when I've talked about working behind the scenes and not being, uh, uh, what I'm saying is I, I'm not going to run in front of every camera uh, and, and, and go there. You know, I, I, I'm not that good looking, so I stay away from cameras. But we can do, we can have transparent government. We don't need behind the scenes deals where uh, folks meet and talk about things that the public needs to know about, like how much reserve we have. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Brandon Short, next question for Mr. Martin. All right. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but what are your plans for developing job opportunities and incentives to keep uh, young talent living and working in Columbus? That's a great question. I, I have a daughter who's a first-year Georgia Tech student studying aerospace engineering. I'd love for her to come home, and she's got that opportunity. In fact, in a couple weeks, she starts an internship at Pratt & Whitney. Uh, we need to continue to grow the economies. Young people go to where the jobs are, and not only that, but upward opportunity. And we've got great upward opportunity in some organizations like Aflac, Synovus, Tesis, and, and organizations like that. Uh, we need to continue to grow those opportunities. But we also need to make sure people feel safe. Even if we have all the jobs in the world, folks are not going to come to where they don't feel safe. And again, the Gallup study shows that folks in Columbus do not feel safe. 49% so they wouldn't want to walk on the street alone. So we've got to balance that, growing our economy, but making people feel safe. And uh, I'm committed, as I said, I have skin in this game now with an 18, soon to be 19 year old uh, in Atlanta. I want her to come home. I'd love for her to work at Georgia Tech. But honey, if you're watching this on the web, whatever you want to do is fine with me. Um, but 
this is, this is a great opportunity we have. When I was in high school, everybody left. That was just the way it was in Columbus. I'm proud to see some of my cohorts are coming home. We need to keep young people here because that's how we're going to continue to grow our economy is keep the young folks here, having families, creating jobs, creating opportunities for the next generation beyond that. Yes, actually, uh, during this administration, we've increased our population uh, to 202,000 people, and that's a 6.3% increase, and a lot of that has been with young people, so we actually have evidence now that we are reversing the brain drain, and that is an awesome trend that we need to uh, continue. I will say that certainly, this is an incredible city. This is an awesome city, and we shouldn't let anybody tell us any differently, um, and Dr. Benjamin Blair has shown uh, that compared to Montgomery and Macon and other cities that are comparable, we are indeed a safe city. But the three things that are bringing young people back, I would say, would be the city village uh, that I've proposed already this evening and talked about. Also, the high-speed rail gives them unlimited opportunities and possibilities, as well as uh, the Benning Tech Park, which is high-paying pay, high uh, military contract jobs. Thank you, Mayor. Dusty, another question for Mayor Tomlinson. Um, Mayor, the city owns a considerable amount of property. Uh, around here, uh, but particularly along the First Avenue corridor between mm -hmm. TSIS and Bibb City. Uh, do you have a plan to return that land to productive use and to get it back on the tax rolls? Yes, actually, that, that is the city village. Um, it's about 30 square blocks. Uh, we own about 33% of that property, which is a phenomenal amount of property to be in public hands, and we need to get it into the private sector and back onto uh, the rolls, tax rolls. And so basically, we're looking at creating um, a residential uh, neighborhood commercial um, uh, community, uh, mixed income living uh, with innovation stations, uh, basically built for the creative industry and the creative class, which is uh, people of all ages, but tends to be people uh, younger, architects, uh, software designers, uh, people in the cultural arts, teachers. Um, it, it would have some of the best views in the city along the riverbank. Uh, also would include a refurbishing of our Second Avenue corridor, which is our major artery into this community. Um, so it's a way for us to get the property that we've acquired uh, through the blight that's happened through years and the disinvestment and get it back on the rolls in a significant way um, that would not only uh, incentivize young people to stay and encourage them to stay, but would bring major creative industries into Columbus, Georgia. It would be among a handful of creative villages in the entire country. Mr. Mark. Several years ago, I went to St. Louis, Missouri with the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and we saw an area called Blueberry Hill, and the Ledger Inquirer was kind enough to quote me as saying that that was a vision for Second Avenue uh, at that time. Uh, we do need to revitalize that. We've, we've got an opportunity there to, because that has now become the gateway to our city. If you're coming down for uh, Whitewater or any number of activities, you come down Second Avenue. But I would say we've also, and I hate to keep going back to safety, but it's a big issue. As you come down the uh, left side, uh, as you're coming down 2nd Avenue, the left side or the east side, that's, that's the North Highland, east, North Highland area, and that's one of the most dangerous areas in the city. We, we've got a, a group there, Mr. Jim Smith is, is working on cleaning that up, but we've got to make that happen. We've got to uh, uh, find a place uh, for homeless, which I you know, know that a lot of uh, private sector groups are working on. It's going to be a collaborative, long-term effort, and the one thing I'm committed to is being collaborative in the leadership. There's folks here like Truth Spring that are doing a great job already. Thank you, Mr. Martin. David Hurst, your next question for Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin, the city has spent millions on the 6th Avenue flood abatement and street street project. With that nearing completion, what can be done to attract private sector investment to the Liberty District and all along that corridor? Well, the Liberty District, I mean, Liberty District is not only important because it's a great underutilized property, but it's really great history. And uh, I think one of the mistakes that's been made recently is to not include the stakeholders who were there already. Uh, that's why there was pushback on the, the change in the plan that we already had a 10-year plan. Again, I'll go back to opportunity zones. I've already proposed to put an opportunity zone there focused on tourism because we have great tourist attractions there like the Liberty Theater, Ma Rainey House, uh, you know, the Royal Cafe, which always is ranked as one of the best restaurants uh, in, in the United States or certainly in the state of Georgia. So we've got reasons to bring folks there. And um, uh, believe me, I understand that flood abatement part. That ran in front of the Chamber of Commerce and we walked across that mud every day while I was there. Uh, so I'm glad to see that happening. 
it, it has, it's ripe with opportunity. That's why I think the opportunity zones, it's the opportunity zones are the best tool the, the state gives cities to do something. And we've got to get that through. We've got to get the six votes on council to make that happen so we can start implementing that. That will help that area and respect the folks who've invested so much into that area. Those, the, the people who've been there and held on through the years are, are very important to have their, their input going forward. Mayor? Uh, yes, actually there was a two-year process of stakeholder meetings and some of those that in the end of course were concerned and asked that the project be stopped attended all of those meetings. Uh, and so I think it's important to know that stakeholders were involved, but as is their right, they had last minute concerns and unfortunately because of the $40 million in federally funded uh, grants that would be used for the residential revitalization, uh, we couldn't make the deadline and resolve those concerns. So that opportunity was lost, uh, but I think it becomes an important symbol of what we can lose if we don't all get on the same page. Uh, I would say that actually urban service district tax abatements as well as redevelopment districts are the best tools that we have uh, for revitalization. Opportunity zones are, are great too, uh, but redevelopment districts have been used all over the country and again at my urging, uh, council is unanimously asked and our delegation has put it on the ballot in November and so we're very excited about that opportunity to have the private financing of public works. It could be phenomenal for the Liberty District. Thank you, Mayor. Brandon, you have the next question for Mayor Tomlinson. All right. Um, what will you do to enhance and improve the relationship between the City of Columbus and Fort Benning? Ah. Uh, well, of course, we have a great relationship and have had a great relationship with Fort Benning. We meet quite, quite regularly. In fact, I saw General McMaster yesterday and saw uh, the garrison commander on Thursday. So I think it's important to have personal social relationships, but also, um, you know, to meet regularly. And we do meet once a month. Uh, the garrison commander and I meet uh, to talk about things. We want to get them involved in some of our quality of life aspects, like we, they just lifted the band on having uh, soldiers in the river so they can participate in dragon boat racing and they can participate uh, in our whitewater rafting. Uh, so we are always looking for ways to partner with them. They're partners uh, with many of our, our schools, so I've been uh, with many of the soldiers and command staff to read to students. Anything that helps strengthen those bonds and of course getting ourselves prepared for the second round of BRAC, which is very exciting. We have some of the newest facilities. The federal government's invested $5 billion uh, in Fort Benning. Uh, we've invested as a community some hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we've shown we can do great things and I think as um, the military begins to uh, resize itself, uh, we stand ready uh, to reap the benefit of that as they close other bases that are more dilapidated. I see that coming our way and we're already working on that. We work on that regularly. Mr. Mark. For the last four years, that's all I did was work on issues related to governmental affairs in Fort Benning. No one's more qualified to do that than me. Uh, I've spent all kinds of time, in fact, some of the issues that she talked about that we were successful in doing, it was because of the effort of the three-person team I was on at the Chamber of Commerce, Gary Jones, Kelly Cargill, and myself. So, you know, I know how the military works. I have the relationships with not only the, the, the active duty people who come and go, but also the civilian population that will, that will be there permanently to move forward on this. And having been involved in uh, winding down the last BRAC and going to Capitol Hill in both Atlanta and Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and working on those issues. I know the folks in, it, in those areas, uh, in the Senator's office and the Congressional offices, who I need to call to work on those offices. So I'm very well prepared to deal with that and look forward to it. All right, thank you so much. This completes our panel uh, questions from our media panel, and we appreciate those. But now we're moving into the next section of our debate tonight. And for that, I'm going to my co-anchor, Teresa Whitaker, who's standing by with some questions from News 3 viewers, as well as readers from the Ledger Inquirer. And we're going to be taking some questions from you, our audience, tonight. Teresa? Thanks, Bill. Our first News 3 viewer question comes from William Middleton. He asks, Columbus touts itself as a consolidated government, yet we do not have consolidated law enforcement. Do you favor consolidating our law enforcement agencies? And this question is for Mr. Martin. Thanks for the question, Mr. Middleton. The decision not to consolidate those was made back in the 70s, uh, and I don't know why that was. However, each of our uh, separate law enforcement agencies has a distinct mission. Um, police do crime and punishment, 
sheriff does civil service and run the jail, and then uh, marshal's office does uh, civil service for the municipal courts. And each plays an important part in what we do. And so I'm not for consolidating because they're all force multipliers and they do separate things uh, to uh, serve our citizens from a public safety point of view. Uh, I think it works and we've seen that going forward. In fact, there's often talked about the marshal, consolidating the marshal and the sheriff. We voted on it as a community three times, uh, the last time being about uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and it's always been the answer is no, I'm not in favor of doing that. Mayor Tomlinson. Yeah. Um, well, Mr. Middleton, I think something we could do, obviously, is consolidate some of the services that each of the three uh, divisions do offer. Uh, we have uh, dueling narcotic, metro narcotics units. We have, uh, uh, we have duplicative um, drug dog units. We have um, duplicative patrol divisions. And so actually the budget chair recently asked for um, a, a rundown of those uh, duplicative services. And I think perhaps we could consolidate them under the appropriate uh, law, law enforcement division and see if we can't reap um, possibly hundreds of thousands or more in savings uh, for the taxpayers and still have a very strong law enforcement um, department in our city. The next question is the first one that we have from our Ledger Inquirer questions that have been submitted. It comes from Fiancia Brown. This one is for you, Mayor Tomlinson. There aren't enough resources for the homeless people in our area. What can the city do to help? Well, um, Ms. Brown, I would say, first of all, we're actually working on that. Uh, we're about to change uh, homelessness as we know it in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, we've adopted a housing first strategy, which uh, many communities have uh, throughout the nation and have radically reduced um, the number of homeless in, in their communities, and we're about to do the same. Uh, we've just received 180 uh, vouchers or funding for units of uh, the chronically homeless uh, with supportive, supportive services from New Horizons and other service providers. And that's very exciting because if we can help and house are chronically homeless. Again, that will radically change homelessness in our community. Uh, we also have had a commission now for two years, a mayor's commission, uh, that is about to release a report on an opportunity resource center uh, which will um, provide transition services for those who are transitioning in and out of homelessness um, and simply need to be put in contact with services to get their life on track so they can maintain long-term housing. Um, it's about uh, bringing together all the people at the table, which we've been doing, great partners in this community, and optimizing their efforts and consolidating their efforts for the benefit of our homeless population and the community as a whole. Mr. Martin. Taking care of our homeless population is one of the core things as, as, that we need to do as people of faith, and so I'm fully supporting of that. I will say, though, that on this particular Opportunity Commission, there's been lots of talk for two years and still no resource center. In fact, one of the members got so frustrated, he went out and started his own resource center uh, using Rose Hill uh, Memorial Baptist Church, as, or Rose Hill Baptist Church, as a place to do that. That was Chaplain Neil Richardson. The key is not what the government can do, the key is what the faith-based community can do. I was asked the other night, what about people of not, who don't believe, who are not faithful? W would they have a role? Of course they'd have a role. We all need to help the most vulnerable among us. It's 150 people who are chronically homeless. The rest are homeless for a short period of time because of job loss. They're usually six to nine months. We need to shrink that down so that, you know, maybe three months, but even more importantly, is that when they lose the job or whatever pushes them into homelessness, that we can get them uh, back into housing as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Now back to my colleague, Teresa Whitaker, for another question. Our next question was formulated by a group of Columbus State University political science students. Mr. Martin, they want to know, what are your plans for the outdated property tax laws where older homeowners continue to pay the same tax rate regardless of the value of their home? Well, first of all, I want to say, first of all, thank you to the CSU students for formulating that question, but I want to say to the folks at home, I am for keeping the tax freeze in place so you don't have to worry about it. I've always thought it was a benefit. Uh, you know, like a 30-year mortgage, you know it's going to stay level for the entire time you owe the ho own the house, and so we ought to sell it that way. You know from day one what your taxes are going to be. Um, you know, are property taxes in general outdated? Well, that's a question we've got to work for statewide. I mean, the reason we pay them in November or October 31st and December 31st was that's when the crops got paid for. The first payment for your crops and the last payment for your crops was based on a, a farm system. 
that could be something we need to go to something different. But I will say this, and this is always a concern every election. The folks who live in homes who have fixed incomes, am I going to be forced out of my home? Also, the folks who live in areas that could grow, am I going to be gentrified out of my home because of property taxes? I'm telling you, I'm committed to keeping the tax freeze so you don't have to worry about that. Mayor Tomlinson? Uh, actually, uh, we do have what's called a welcome stranger tax because of our property tax freeze. Uh, it wasn't intended to be that way, but it's something that has grown out of it, which means if you come to Columbus or if you even choose to downsize, you will be hit with much higher taxes comparatively because of the freeze. Uh, we also, of course, as I said before, we tax people on value they do not own because if you're frozen from upward valuation, you're frozen from downward valu valuation. So recently after the recession, people's property values decreased didn't matter we continue to tax them on that higher value which is one of the only jurisdictions in the country that does that and it's just an incredible shock to people when they realize that we're taxing them on something that they do not own it also results in us having the highest occupancy tax uh, which is tax on business and actually uh, inhibits our competitiveness for new jobs and so can we do better you bet we can uh, that was a, a great system for the 80s but what I propose is if you have the property tax freeze you keep the property tax freeze in per perpetuity just as you have it, but all new transfers uh, transfer best in a new system with a 10% property tax decrease, which is something we can offer you because we'll be getting rid of the inefficiencies of the system. It's something very much worth discussing, something the voters will have to decide on, and it's an exciting proposal that protects people but also offers a new system for a new day. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question comes from a News 3 viewer, Michael Earhart asks, who's in charge of making sure that road repairs are done properly in this city? The repair work is so bad that hitting repaired patches is as bad or worse than hitting the unrepaired potholes. Mm -hmm. And Mayor, your response to that? Yeah, well actually anybody who has a concern about anything having to do with potholes or roads can call 311 or 653-4000 and report it uh, and that will be repaired within three days. Uh, so we do have a system, our Deputy City Manager David Arrington oversees that. Um, if there's a specific concern, uh, we can get on it and I hate to hear that anybody's having trouble, um, but it could be too that if the road uh, is, is needing to be completely repaved and scraped down, they could be on a list, they're just patchworking it temporarily until they get up to have a complete road repaving. So the best thing to do, and these are part of the 200 emails I answer every single day, email me, call 311 uh, or 653-4000 uh, and ask the question and find out exactly where your street and your concern is on the list to be repaved. Mr. Mark. You know, somebody told me when I ran for mayor, not only should I talk, say that I was going to repair the potholes, I'll sink the traffic lights. Uh, we all fought that battle, hitting red light after red light. I want to talk briefly, because the mayor answered the question in terms of the mechanics of it. There's nothing I can add to that. But I want to say that was one of the reasons that I supported the T-Splost, was because $300 million was going to be added to the city coffers to do repairs just like that. It was a very broad definition. Anything uh, related to uh, property, to uh, uh, fixing transportation, potholes, and that kind of thing. In fact, actually, you know, in her 2013 State of the City address, the mayor at minute, go to YouTube and see it, minute, minute 458, she said, I showed, called me out by name, and said, I showed tremendous leadership for putting $300 million in city coffers. And then a month ago, as I said, said I was a terrible person for being in charge of it. So, you know, but look, we'll fix the potholes and we'll make it happen. All right, we're now headed out to uh, the audience where Teresa Whitaker is standing by with another question. Teresa? Our next question comes from a Ledger Inquirer reader. Caitlin Townsend asks, can Columbus eventually become a no-kill community? And this question is for Colin Martin. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Townsend, for your question. You know, there's an 11-step process to go to a no-kill community. Let's, let's define it for people who don't know. There's a lot of animal lovers out there. When an animal's picked up, how do we deal with it? And sometimes animals are killed who have no reason to be. They're healthy, they're, they, they would be great pets, but we get overstocked. But there's a process, there's an organization called No Kill Community and they've got an 11 step process. I won't go through all 11 steps, but we've got a lot of it in place. We have uh, uh, folks who are doing uh, foster care, we have folks that are doing rescue, we have uh, uh, folks that are doing uh, trap, neuter, and release. In fact, I've participated in per, uh, myself, and I want to say, Caitlin, you have my commitment that we will move toward being a no-kill community. 
Mayor Tomlinson? Well, um, that won't be a very far journey because we are on the, cu uh, on the cusp of being a no-kill uh, community right now. In fact, the past three months, uh, the euthanasia rate at our um, Animal Care and Control Center has been in the low 20s. Uh, when I took office, uh, the euthanasia rate was 80% in this community, but we adopted a uh, Save a Pet plan, which is based on the no-kill criteria. We're now the number one animal care control uh, center in the state of Georgia. We have the lowest euthanasia rate. We're one of the lowest in the entire nation, and it's because of that Save a Pet plan. We've gone from 80% euthanasia rate to 38% in 2013, and as I said, we've been in the low 20s. No-kill is 10% or less. That is phenomenal for a mandated shelter that has to take every single animal, regardless of whether it's sick or injured. Uh, and so we have come a very long way. I've been in animal rescue for 25 years, so I'm not new to this. I do welcome uh, Mr. Martin's enthusiasm for it. But, uh, but we have come a long way, and we're one of the best in the country. We have another question now submitted by a political science student here at Columbus State University. The question is, what would you do to bring more visitors, activities, and events to Columbus, to downtown Columbus, on Sundays, Mayor? Oh, on Sundays. Well, of course, now that we've adjusted and have the, the alcohol uh, ordinance, there is more uh, that we can do on Sundays um, downtown. Uh, but we do have festivals. Uh, we are working, of course, with our CVB and our Uptown, and, uh, and I think you see a lot more activity. Um, with the students coming down there, not only now do we have 600 students, but we're looking at the Health and Science Center. That also will create a greater density down there, uh, more festivals, uh, not just city sponsored but private uh, sponsored and so I think you're going to see them uh, just like you have on uh, Friday nights and Saturdays also um, bleeding over into Sundays and a lot of activities related to the river runs, cycle events and things of that nature are carrying over on t into Sundays as it is now so we'll continue that. Mr. Mark. There's some things I think we can still do like get food trucks and uh, uh, have those in the downtown area that'll, that'll help drive folks there on Sunday. Uh, have some kind of festival around that. Uh, I, I, my wife and I go down there and eat with our kids after church and yeah it's a little sparse but uh, get, we as a community just need to go down there. Uptown's done a great job of attracting folks and I think as the weather warms up we'll see more folks down there. I do want to respond to this thing about no kill. My wife's in the audience mayor and I'd like for you to go tell her to welcome her because we've been saving rescued animals since when honey since probably before we even met you were doing that so I'm not new to this. Uh, and I appreciate, you know, you always think you were there first. You were not there first. I just never saw you there. That's well, because I was doing the work, not years. showing up in front of the camera. Um, oh, but, uh, look, um, you feed a baby squirrel at 4 o'clock in the morning and tell me about that. <laughs> Don't make me get out my whistle. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this is, this is the issue. I mean, it's, it's, it's always she was the first one. She's the only one been doing it. This, this is a team effort in our community. Everything's happened because of leadership, collaborative leadership. Nobody gets all the credit. We all deserve the credit. We appreciate you and the audience being here at University Hall tonight, and you have submitted some questions, and it's finally your time. And we head back out to Teresa Whitaker for those. Teresa? This question is, what specific steps would you take to educate the citizens of Columbus about the necessity of recycling? Too many people are simply unaware and blasé. And this question is for Mayor Teresa Tomlinson. Great. Well, we have our uh, world-class uh, recycle center now, which is very exciting. Uh, we also are looking to bring in Fort Benning to our recycle center, uh, and so uh, that is expanding it. We are using um, Keep Columbus Beautiful, which has always been a wonderful partner for us, and we recently were able to obtain a partnership uh, with Coca-Cola, uh, the Recycle and Win, which you may have seen um, some of the promotions on TV and some of the print advertising, that if you go to Piggly Wiggly and put, uh, put a sticker on your recycle Cycle bin, you can win $50 gift certificate Piggly Wiggly. Uh, so we're getting the word out, teaching people how to recycle, uh, hitting them in the schools, of course, because when the kids get ad addicted to recycling, they bring it home. Uh, it's amazing. We've increased recycling 100% since our recycle center has been uh, opened, and that's, uh, that is just amazing progress, and we continue to build on it. Mr. Mark. Well, Ms. Tomlinson mentioned Fort Benning. That was one of the projects I was working on with our three-person team about 
getting the recycling center, and getting access to Fort Benning, and I think that's a that's a great way to do it. In fact, actually, for this program to work, we've got to have Fort Benning involved uh, to have their recycling and not only their waste. One of the other things we're working on is a waste energy center so that we can uh, create green energy uh, using uh, uh, material from both Columbus and Fort Benning, sell those green energy credits to Fort Benning, which can use them to meet their uh, criteria of being 15% recycling uh, in the um, uh, criteria, 15% has to come from green sources by 2015. So they're, they can be a great partner for us moving forward. Um, and you know, I, I got an email from a city employee who asked for one of those big blue recycling bins, and at least as of the other day, still hadn't gotten it. So we need to do more to get those big recycling bins out. I bought my own because you know you're amazed once you learn what's recyclable, you can fill out one of those built big bins every week. Thank you, sir. Teresa? The next question is for Colin Martin. It has been said that city employee morale is down. What would you do over the next four years to boost it? That's a great question. That is, in fact, a very, very good question. Uh, first of all, I think treating them with respect and dignity. Uh, you know, we've, we've, I've seen so many folks that feel like that this mayor has tried to balance the uh, budget on their backs. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a, one person who sent an email to her that was saying, look, you know, by making my wife get her health insurance from where she is, you're cutting my pay. Uh, I think listening to them, listening to their ideas, being responsive to them, treating them with dignity and respect. I have been amazed. You know, usually city employees and the fo folks in public safety are kind of not as, they stay out of this stuff. But I have been amazed by how many have contacted me, have signs in their yards, are supporting me, and I'm honored and humbled by that. And I'm committed. To those of you who work for the city, I will treat you with honor and dignity and respect and listen to you when I'm mayor. Yeah. Mayor Thomas? Yeah. Let's, let's just clear this up. Uh, first of all, I do have honor and respect for, the city, for our employees and show it every single day because we have the hardest working employees anywhere in this country. And in fact, when their pension was going down the drain with a 73% and decreasing funding, I stepped in to reform it. I could have passed the buck on that and waited 15 years for them to find out they didn't have the pension that they thought they did, but we reformed it and through collaborative leadership we got uh, 10 votes from council for unanimous support and now it's 88 percent funded. It's not been on their backs. We gave them a raise in order to offset that pension and, and that we got it done. I would also say with the health care and the individual he's talking about, the last email I had with that individual was thank you because he didn't realize that he was going to be okay and there was another option. So he was concerned at first. We had an email concern, uh, an email conversation and through information he was able to see that his family is going to be okay because we're offering an opportunity for them to have a viable but less expensive health care plan. Candidates, we now have time for your closing statements, which will be one minute and 45 seconds long. And Mr. Martin, you will begin. Well, thank you. I do want to address real quick the pension issue because that actually started under Mayor Weatherington and there was a committee of I think 25 to 30 city employees involved. Once again, it was not just Teresa Tomlinson. During her campaign in 2010, Teresa Tomlinson said we needed 80 more officer, police officers than we had then. Today we have 24 less than when she started her term and now she says we need more gardens and sidewalks to make people feel safe. She said that she would complete an efficiency audit for the entire, for every department in city government. Four years later, we only have two done. She promised to push economic development to South Columbus, yet unemployment is over 11% in the 31903 zip code. Writing a report, issuing a press release, and saying you've done something isn't leadership. On the day I announced my candidacy, seven elected officials sat in the front row, not because of a fight over money or budget, but because Teresa Tomlinson has failed to lead. Governing is a team effort. Leaders know you can, get in, you can do anything if you don't care who gets credit. I promise to listen more than I talk. I promise I don't have to be the person who is always right. I promise to work every day to make you feel safe and grow our local economy. I promise I will work with and not against other elected officials to reduce crime and solve our city budget issues. I promise I'll advance solutions and not promote myself. When J.R. Allen was mayor of Columbus, he had a sign on his desk that said, God first, you second, me third. That's the kind of mayor I want to be for Columbus. In closing, 
I ask that you do this. If you know a city employee, especially someone in public safety, ask that person who they plan to vote for. More often than not, you will hear they're voting for me. Then ask yourself why the very people we elected Teresa Thomason to lead are the most who want to change. Thank you, I Mr. ask for your vote on May time. 20th. Thank you, sir. Mayor Tomlinson, you have a minute 45. Sure. Well, when I hear Colin Martin talk about me, the thing I think is, uh, I know he's against me, but is he for you? And I know also he doesn't know me. Uh, but I know, look, Colin Martin doesn't know me, but I know you do. Uh, because I've been out to your neighborhoods, your neighborhood association meetings, I've been to your kids' schools, I've been to your civic events, I've been to your fraternity and sorority uh, gatherings, I've been to your blood drives, I've been out in the community because I care about your lives and that's what I show every single day. I have shown leadership for this city. It has been remarkable what we have been able to accomplish. There are cities across this country that are in bankruptcy right now because they wouldn't touch the pension reform. We did it. We got unanimous support of council. When we first start, started talking about our health and wellness center, which is a tremendous benefit for our employees, which they thank us for every single day, they said, let's not get in it, but we got 10 votes, unanimous support of council. The urban service districts, unanimous support of council. The redevelopment district, unanimous support of council. And I could go on. It is, it is a difficult and arduous process to lead a great city like this, but that is that exactly what you've seen. And yes, there were some folks on the front row of Colin Martin's uh, opening, but there were more elected officials at my opening, city councilors, state delegation, school board, elected officials. But the fact of the matter is we're a family. We're not always going to get along. We're going to have tough tough uh, discussion sometimes, but two days after appearing in a picture on Colin Martin's campaign kickoff, Councillor Glenn Davis called me and asked me to help him with his hotel, to go to Washington, D.C. with him for the city of Columbus, and I said yes without blinking an eye. And that, my friends, is leadership getting things done for this community, and That's we're going to move forward. Mayor Tomlinson, thank you. Thank you to our candidates tonight. We also want to thank our WRBL partners, Columbus State University, CSU TV, PMB Broadcasting, the Ledger Inquirer, the Greater Columbus Chamber of Commerce. A special thank you. Affleck. Affleck. Tell me he was good, dude. Yeah, he stinks at golf, but he was great at getting my claim paid fast. How fast? Mine got paid in four days. Wow, that's awesome. Is that legal? Big fat new. Find out how fast Aflac can pay you at aflac.com.